Hey booktube, it's Peg. I am back at the history shelf. Um, it's been about a week since my last video. I've missed you guys. Uh, it's been a busy week of reading, uh, uh, writing. I finished a book review. Yay! <laughs> my written book review of Revolutionary Brothers, which is uh, now up at Open Letters Review. And if you are interested in my thoughts on that book, which I have shown on this channel, um, I will link it below. Um, but this is my Friday Reads video. I'm very excited to actually be doing a Friday Reads on a Friday. Um, it's also a Friday Reads slash some new arrivals. So I've gotten some new books. And uh, big surprise. <laughs> and um, let's see. Let's just dive right in first with what I've been reading. And um, got some good good ones here. Let's start off with this book that I am... I will be reviewing um, uh, for Book Browse Review, and this book is some 150 pages in and I can't put it down. This is a brand new release. This is Yellow Bird, Oil, Murder, and a Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country by Sierra Crane Murdoch. And uh, wow, I just, uh, I can't stop reading it. It's so good. Let me just give you a quick uh, overview of what this book is. <clears throat> it's the gripping true story of a murder on an Indian reservation and the unforgettable Arakara woman who becomes obsessed with solving it, an urgent work of literary journalism and social criticism. Uh, let's see. Uh, when Lissa Yellowbird was released from prison in 2009, she found her home, the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota, transformed by the Bakken oil boom. In her absence, the landscape had been altered beyond recognition, her tribal government swayed by corporate interests, and her community burdened by surge in violence and addiction. Three years later, when Lissa learned that a young white oil worker, Christopher K.C. Clark, had disappeared from his reservation work site, she became particularly concerned. No one knew where Clark had gone, and few people were actively looking for him. Yellowbird traces Lissa's steps as she obsessively hunts for clues to Clark's uh, disappearance. She navigates two worlds, uh, that of her own tribe, uh, changed by its newfound wealth, and that of the non-native oilmen, down on their luck, who have come to find work on the heels of the economic recess uh, recession. Her pursuit of Clark is also a pursuit of redemption, as Lissa atones for her own crimes and uh, reckons with generations of trauma. Yellow Bird is an exquisitely written, masterfully reported story about a search for justice and a remarkable portrait of a complex woman who is smart, funny, eloquent, compassionate, and often vex vexingly shrewd. Uh, drawing on eight years of immersive investigation, Sierra Crane Murdoch has produced a profound examination of the legacy of systematic violence uh, inflicted on a tribal nation and a tale of extraordinary healing. And... Uh, it's just, it is it is so well written, um, getting to know uh, Alyssa Yellowbird and um, <clears throat> her obsession with this case. And, and uh, you know, I'm not done with it yet, but I am just really enjoying this book. So I highly, uh, so far, recommend it. I, I don't think it will change, but uh, Yellowbird. So that's my first Friday Reads. Um, the other book I'm working on right now is... Uh, Javier Circas's Lord of All the Dead, a nonfiction novel. I had originally seen this book come across on Steve's channel a while ago. Um, and I know he also expressed some... Uh, or, uh, what can we say, a nonfiction novel. How can it be a novel <coughs> if it's nonfiction? And how can it be nonfiction if it's a novel? Um... But this is centered around the author's, I think his great uncle, who, um, who died fighting for Franco in the Spanish Civil War, So, which I find interesting. And so there definitely is a historical interest for me in this book. Um, I'm about, oh, about 83 pages in. And uh, so far it's just him trying to find out details on this young man's life. He died at 19 in one of the uh, first battles. <clears throat> he was a, a phalangist, which, which was a party, um, a political party at the time. So I, I'm learning more about the, um, the, um, 
how they differentiated between a Francoist and a Falangist. And apparently Falangist was not as bad as a Franco, a Franco supporter or a Francoist. So, you know, those are, those are things that I'm not um, especially read up on. So I love learning new things and especially about uh, Spanish Civil War which is, uh, you know, I know some of the basics, but I, I'd like to know more. So this is a very interesting take on that, but a very personal one. So, you know, so far you can only just read it in the eyes of the author as he searches for more information in the village that, that he returns to, to talk to people, um, to find out more about his, uh, his great uncle, Manuel Almena. So this is the, also the other book I'm reading right now. And uh, for the book two prize judging, I'm judging in round one. And uh, one of the other books that I am uh, reading out of a, a group of six, uh, um, I chose this one to read next. It's Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Sepp or Kep. Don't know yet. I do need to look that up. Um, I, I think I'm going to begin it this weekend because uh, I still need to pound out about three more books. Um, by March 30th, but I think I've read a description of this in one of my last videos. Um, but uh, it's it's a story about Harper Lee, who um, had an idea later in her life, um, in the 1970s, to write her own, maybe write her own version of In Cold Blood, um, about a crime that happened in the 70s. Um, she attended this trial. Um, of this reverend and uh, yeah, but she wasn't able to finish it, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by it. It's, it's, it's a bestseller right now. I know. Um, but this is the next book I'll be starting this weekend, but uh, for right now I am reading pretty heavily these two. Sorry. Let me just get that yellow bird and Lord of all the dead and Margaret Thatcher. That's right. Boo. That's not why I'm here. Boo. Yes. Um, <laughs> I am not giving up on that book. It is Give massive. Up on it. She's horrible. Oh. Hot spoiler. She doesn't change. Okay. She doesn't change. Well, everyone changes. <laughs> you don't need to know what I said. Anyway, thank you, Peanut Gallery over there. Appreciate that. Uh, I know it. All right. So, um, and then also I'm trying to, you know, get some of my magazine reading done because they keep coming in <laughs> like a river. Um, there's so many good things to read. I, I subscribe to so many different magazines. I just got, um, oh man, got another military history magazine that came in. I will do a dedicated magazine video, I promise, guys, but again, the new military history magazine, Mystery Ship. After seven decades, a sunken destroyer uh, gives up its secrets. This is the uh, the May issue. But oh, gosh, May. Wow, they're really getting ahead of themselves. Um, I also, look, it's still in the paper. <laughs> I got Foreign Affairs. Um, this is uh, the March-April 2020 issue, so great. Got to work on that. Oh, and I just thought I'd try out this, um, this is the U.S. version of it, still in the shrink wrap, but I've got the Spectator, um, U.S. edition, March 2020. The party's over. We'll see. I read a lot of stuff, guys. Um, okay, well, that's just some, but I've got, um, quite a few things. I started reading my new American Scholar uh, magazine, which I um, am liking. So, again, a magazine video to come. And I think that Faith at Faith and Books is going to do a, mag a May Magazines Month, which I think is awesome. Um, I don't have articles. I think she stipulated one of the rules is that you should read an, um, a magazine article that was printed before the year of your birth. So uh, I'd have to, you know, look online and try to find some things that are, well, I'm not going to say my birth year. I, mean, I almost did. Oh, I'm glad I caught myself. Uh, all right, let's move on to some uh, new arrivals, shall we? So this is the history shelf. And so, you know, we got to have history and we have plenty of that. So here we go. 
I requested this book because I heard a um, um, a podcast. Um, I think it was BBC X, BBC the History Extra podcast, which is a great podcast. You guys should check it out. You can just um, find that on iTunes or wherever. Um, and uh, they were in, interviewing this author, and this is brand new. And I do want to read it and I'll do a review on it and share with you guys what I think of this book. But this is Sinclair McKay's The Fire and the Darkness, The Bombing of Dresden, 1945. And this was put out by St. Martin's Press. So I'm very excited for this book. Um, let me just read you a brief description. Did I move my glasses? Well, I don't think... I think, you know what, we're going to go with my old, my old eyes right now. Um... On February 13, 1945, at 10.03 p.m., British bombers began one of the most devastating attacks of World War II, the bombing of Dresden. The first contingent killed people and destroyed buildings, roads, and other structures. The second rained down fire, turning the streets into a blast furnace, turning the... Oh, I already said that. Um, the shelters into... Oh, okay, let me, let me start that over because this is really serious stuff. The second rained down fire turning the streets into a blast furnace, uh, the shelters into ovens, and whipping up a molten hurricane in which the citizens of Dresden were, uh, this is horrible, were burned, baked, or suffocated to death. Uh, early the next day, American bombers finished off what was left. Sinclair McKay's The Fire and the Darkness is a pulse-pounding work of history that looks at the life of the city in the days before the attack, tracks each moment of the bombing, and considers the long period of reconstruction and recovery. Uh, the fire in the darkness is powered by McKay's narrative of this unthinkable terror from the points of view of the ordinary civilians. Margot Hill, an apprentice brewery worker. Gisela Reichelt, a 10-year-old schoolgirl. Uh, boys conscripted into the Hitler Youth. Uh, choristers of the Kreuzkirch Choir. Artists, shop assistants, and classical musicians, as well as the Nazi official station there. What happened that night in Dresden was calculated annihilation in a war that was almost over. Uh, McKay's brilliant work takes a complex human view of this terrible night and its aftermath in a gripping book that will be remembered long after the last page is turned. Um, so yeah, definitely won't be an easy read. But I've, oft, I've, I've often uh, thought about Dresden and, you know, when you think about Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, and people, you know, realize, too, that uh, the incendiaries they used in Dresden um, were just as horrific as it describes in the, in the, in the jacket here. Um, the chemicals that were used, it basically turned the air into fire. And uh, if you were to, to find like a brick enclosed, um, oh, like a cellar, for instance, even though it was brick lined and you think you'd be safe, as this book states, you, you, you were basically, you were baked. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's horrific and it makes you, and it makes you wonder. And that was the Allies, well, the Allies did, yeah, I mean, War is hell. War is hell. And uh, this book is going to really go into that. Okay, so but that's a brand new release. And I'll let you know uh, what I think of that as, as I progress in my reading on that. Oh, and then, okay, so the good people at Casemate Publishing. Um, they just have great books, military history books. So I've got a few here that came in. Um, and I'm very excited to show them. I've gotten into Renaissance Italy lately. I think it, it all started when I did a, a book review for Open Letters on the Borgias. Um, it was a great book by Paul Strathern, who ha also has a new book out about empire, which I also want to read. Um, but I got kind of intrigued by the warfare aspect of it as well. And I think this book is a classic that they just did a reprint on. And... Uh, yeah, let me know if you've seen this book or, or read it. It's Mercenaries and Their Masters, Warfare and Re Renaissance Italy by Michael Mallet, or Millet, um, forward by William Caffaro. So basically, this one says, 
Uh, Michael Millay's classic study of Renaissance warfare in Italy is as relevant today as it was when it was first published a generation ago. There you go. Uh, his lucid account of the age of the condottieri, the mercenary captains of fortune, and of the soldiers who fought under them is set in the wider context of the Italian society of the time and the warring city-states who employed them. A fascinating picture emerges of the mercenaries themselves, of their commanders and their campaigns, but also of the way in which war was organized and practiced in the Renaissance world. The um, book concentrates on the 15th century, a confused period of turbulence and transition, when standing armies were formed in Italy and more modern types of military organization took hold across Europe. But it also looks back to the Middle Ages and the 14th century and forward to the Italian wars of the 16th century when foreign armies disputed the European balance of power on Italian soil. So this looks outstanding. Get some good maps and stuff. Maybe we got some other thing. Let me see here. Oh, yeah. Your usual in inserts of uh, artwork of the period. Oh, yeah, the armor, weaponry, good stuff. So, this is looking very, very good. Yeah, this is by... Well, Casemate is the overall publisher, but I think this book is by Pen and Sword. Uh, it's an imprint, I believe, and the Pen and Sword is outstanding. Oh, yes, so this kind of goes along with another book I have. Um... This is also Pen and Sword, publisher, and um, this is the Amritsar Massacre, the British Empire's Worst Atrocity, by Vanessa Holborn. Um, this is a slim little volume. Um, this one's about 163 pages. Uh, let's see. The shocking massacre of uh, 379 unarmed Indians in the enclosed... Woo! I can't pronounce this. Jallianwala Ba on the command of a British army officer on April 13, 1919, is considered a brutal example of colonial abuse. Immediately afterwards, martial law was established with harsh penalties and punishments. Often considered as the darkest period of the Raj, the massacre helped galvanize Indian nationalism, making full independence inevitable. Um, oh, this is interesting take. Yet both the Queen and former Prime Minister David Cameron have, side, have sidestepped calls for an apology for the mass shooting during official visits to Amritsar. 100 years on, is it time to say sorry? Uh, this book examines the context in which the infamous event took place and asks why something that happened 100 years ago remained so controversial. Did the order to fire prevent further native and imperialist bloodshed in the Punjab? Was enough done at the time to investigate if General Robert Dyer acted alone or with the full support of his superiors? Who was ultimately responsible for the 1,650 rounds of ammunition discharged that day? Uh, readers will discover how tensions within the region and political and professional ambitions on both sides combined to create a chain of events that signaled the beginning of the end for the British Raj. So, uh, this is going to be good, and it, it's, it sounds kind of uh, um, like it takes a little bit of a... I like it. She's, she's kind of saucy. She's like, you know, do you think it's time to say sorry? Hello? Uh, <laughs> most books of history don't, like, uh, get that mix in the, you know, the contemporary uh, issues of the, of, the, of the day by, you know, looking at the queen and the prime minister 100 years later and laying it at their feet. But... Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a question worth asking. Looks like Vanessa Holborn's gonna do that in this book, so that'll be a good read. This, like I said, this goes along with another book I have. Hang on one second. Another Amritsar book, which is more of an in-depth history, uh, by Kim Wagner. Um, so this is a very new. I think this just came out earlier um, this year or late last year. Um, hang on, guys, sorry. Getting out of frame here. Um, yeah, this came out late last year. And um, this received a lot of blurbs. And it's, it's, it's far more dense. Um, it's a small little paperback. 
compared to this size. This one's kind of skinny. I think this will be like a, 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 a good read after I, I take on this one. It is uh, heavily footnoted. It looks like she's her bibliography is insane, this Kim Wagner book here. Um, the footnotes are amazing. It's about 265 pages minus the um, footnotes and uh, bibliography. And this one is called An Empire of Fear and the Making of a Massacre. So I've got two good books on the um, the Emritzar Massacre. This does seem like the channel of gloom and doom sometimes with these. <laughs> I think someone else might have mentioned that. I've got some like, you know, I've got a row of books back behind me on Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, Mao. Like I said, I I have a, a sub-major in um, dictators. I don't know what that is. Anyway, okay, so I have those. And this is more, and then I got one more book from uh, Casemate. This one is the Casemate um, uh, book. It's not Pen and Sword. Um, it's fairly new. This came out, oh, you can have the pup sheet here. This came out, oh, okay, well, I got the finished copy. It actually comes out tomorrow. So you're seeing it here first. Um, this is the CIA war in Kurdistan. The untold story of the Northern Front in the Iraq War by Sam Faddis. Um, I am fascinated by the Kurds. I, I'm just fascinated by them. They are such fierce fighters and um, have fought for so long for their own land and uh, for their own state and have partnered so many times with America and uh, I feel this last time around we we abandoned them and I think it's just awful but so I really wanted to read this book uh, let me just give you a brief rundown on the CIA, CIA war in Kurdistan let me hold that up for you while I read it uh, in early 2002 Sam Faddis was named to head a CIA team that would enter Iraq prepare the battlefield and facilitate the entry of follow-on conventional military forces, numbering in excess of 40,000 American soldiers. Um, this force, built around the 4th Infantry Division, would, in partnership with Kurdish forces and with the assistance of Turkey, engage Saddam's army in the north as part of a coming invasion. Fattis expected to be on the ground inside Iraq within weeks and that the entire campaign would likely be over by summer. Over the next year, virtually every aspect of that plan for the conduct of the war in northern Iraq fell apart. Um, the 4th Infantry Division never arrived, nor did any other conventional forces in substantial number. The Turks not only did not provide support, they worked overtime to prevent the U.S. from achieving success. An Arab army that was to assist U.S. forces fell apart before it ever made it to the field. Alone, hopelessly outnumbered, short on supplies, and threatened by Iraqi assassination teams and Islamic ex extremists, Fadis' team, working with Kurdish Peshmerga, love the Peshmerga, uh, nonetheless paved the way for a brilliant and largely bloodless victory in the north and the fall of Saddam's Iraq. That victory, handed over to Washington and the Department of Defense on a silver platter, was then squandered. Are we surprised? The surrender of Iraqi forces in the north was spurned. All existing governmental institutions were, in the name of deep athification, dismantled. All input from Fadis's team, which had been in country for almost a full year, was ignored. The consequences of these actions were and continue to be catastrophic. This is the story of an incredibly brave and effective team of men and women who overcame massive odds and helped end, end the nightmare of Saddam's rule in Iraq. It is also the story of how incompetence, bureaucracy and ignorance threw that success away and condemned Iraq and the surrounding region to chaos. So uh, this is going to be a, a very interesting read. I cannot wait to, to dig into this one once I finish my uh, book two prize reading. There's a lot of books I want to just, um, just dive into and this is one of them. It's about 225 pages and here's our author. Hang on a second. go. 
um, yeah. So we've got some pictures and stuff in here. This is going to be good. All right, so those are some of my arrivals from Casemate and Pen and Sword. Um, and then I think I'll, I'll show you two more books, and then I'll wrap it up because we're at 25 minutes already. Um, so let me just preface this little story here. You know, so sometimes, you know, when you're on Amazon and you're browsing books and stuff, um, th this book wasn't even in my cart. I just kind of stumbled across it in the, like, the, you know, the titles that'll say, uh, if you're looking at a book and you drop down and it'll say other titles recommended for you, like based on the book you're looking at, it had this one in the footer. And I was like, oh, yes, I've been, I, that's one of the books I wanted to get for a while and I haven't. And then I opened it. I mean, and it's like a brand new book, Oxford, Oxford University Press. And it was like $7.70. I love when I find those little gems where for some weird reason, they just mark a book down like 70% and it doesn't last. It's like one of those weird things where I, I bought this book and then I went to go look at it like 20 minutes later and it, the price had already went up. So it's like, I just really lucked out. And this book is Bosom Friends, The Intimate World of James Buchanan and William Rufus King by Thomas J. Belsersky. <laughs> I got it. It's Oxford. Oxford University Press. Brand new book. Brand new book. $7. $7. Uh, the Friendship of the, of the Bachelor of the Bachelor Politicians, James Buchanan, um, of Pennsylvania and William Rufus King of Alabama has excited much speculation through the years. Why did neither marry? This better be racy. It could be racy. It better be. Uh, might they have been gay? There you go. Or was their relationship a 19th century version of the modern day bromance? Uh, I really hate that word. But anyway, um, in this book, Balsersky explores the lives of these two politicians and discovers one of the most significant collaborations in American political history. He traces the parallels in the men's personal and professional lives before elected office, including their failed romantic courtships and the stories they told about them. Uh, unlikely companions from the start, they lived, okay, they lived together as congressional messmates in, in a Washington, D.C. boarding house and became close confidants. Uh, around the nation's capital, the men were mocked for their, oh, Okay. I never knew this. This is going to be a really fun read. Um, around the nation's capital, the men were mocked for their effeminacy and perhaps their sexuality, and they were likened to Siamese twins. Over time, their intimate friendship blossomed into a significant cross-sectional political partnership. Belsersky examines Buchanan's and King's contributions to the um, Jacksonian political agenda, manifest destiny, and the increasingly divisive debates over slavery. While contesting interpretations that the men lacked political principles and deserved blame for the breakdown of the union. Well, that's a very bold, brave argument to take because um, up until the present time, I mean, most people say that James Buchanan was the worst U.S. president ever. He could, because he was so ineffectual, he, he did nothing to put the brakes on um, the coming of the Civil War, and in fact, probably threw some kerosene on it. So, um, I'll be interested to see how this, this author makes that argument that, in fact, um, that he had political principles and he doesn't deserve the blame for the breakdown of the Union. I mean, there were a lot of things that led to the Civil War, we all know that, um, but James Buchanan was just... He was not, he was not, he was not an effectual man. And so I, this is, this is going to be, I love to read an opposing viewpoint um, because uh, I, I don't even know how he can make that case. So this is going to be good. Um, he says here, he closely narrates each man's rise to national prominence. Um, as William Rufus King was elected vice president in 1852 and James Buchanan, the nation's 15th president. There's a typo in the dust jacket. How did that get by anyone? It says the nation's 15th president, nation's 15th president in 1856, despite the political gossip that circulated about them. Um, huh. 
This is interesting. While exploring a same-sex relationship that powerfully shaped national events in the antebellum era, Bosom Friends demonstrates that intimate male friendships among politicians were and continue to be an important part of success in American politics. What about them apples? Lindsey Graham is featured heavily. Boom! <laughs> Sorted. Mic drop. Thank you. Well, he was very tight. That's what, that's what he said. Oh, okay. You know what? This is not, this is, <laughs> we're not doing that. We're not going there. Anyway, I didn't realize when, I, I had read a little bit about this book, but I didn't, I guess I didn't really go into detail on the uh, the dust jacket. I didn't really know that he was going to be saying that they're, he was going to explore their so-called effeminance, effeminacy and uh, same-sex relation. Were they gay? I mean, I just figured, because I have read about these things, a lot of these men were very close, but it wasn't anything sexual at all. I so I who knows? I'm intrigued by this, and I only I got it for like seven eight dollars. I'm so excited, um, even despite the typo in the dust jacket. I am a great proofreader, Oxford University Press. Just so you know, if you ever need an extra set of eyes, I've got eagle eyes over here. Um, so bo bosom friends, guys. That's the next uh, new arrival. And then, and then this final one, I um, I forgot that I requested this a long a while ago from University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, when I got it, I was like, oh yeah, I think I did want this, and I asked for it. And uh, this kind of goes in with my theological studies. Um, this is quite different, you guys. So let's get into it. I got the God Man in the Sea, the Empty Tomb, the Trauma of the Jews, and the Gospel of Mark by Michael J. Fate. Um, I think I was drawn to this because the Gospel of Mark is one of my, it's like my favorite gospel. Although I am doing a very in-depth study on the book of John right now. And um, about six chapters in. I'm, I've read John before, but um, I'm really studying it hardcore now. Um, even got some some extra guides on it. Um, I'm doing a, reading a commentary. It was actually chatting on the comments section of, of, of Jack at Rambling Rack and Tours channel. Um, I think, um, I forget what the name of the video was he was doing today. Maybe March of the Mammoths, I think? He held up three of the books, I think, that he's doing, and one of them is Raymond E. Brown's Introduction to the New Testament, which I did get last year. Um, but he, um, he was chatting with someone else in the comments, and he mentioned that uh, Raymond E. Brown also did a two-volume study of the Gospel of John, so I was just like, wow, I need to look into that <laughs> since I'm studying that right now. But I really like Mark. I, I really enjoy the, um, I think Mark Mark is the shortest, is the shortest um, uh, gospel out of the four. And it moves with such, it is an urgent book. It just, you have, you don't have a lot of dilly-dallying at all. It's like, as he tells the story, Jesus is constantly moving forward towards the cross, towards the mission. Um, and it just has this urgency. Like, we don't have time to waste. We need to show you what this is about. So I just love the Gospel of Mark. So I thought this could be an interesting book. And just kind of skimming through it, I mean, he, this could be a little bit daunting for me, but, you know, I'm going to see what I can pick up from it because, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of, um, he's using a lot of the Greek in here. So he's, he's doing a lot of exegetical work in here. Um, there's the Greek words over here. I, I don't know Greek. I can't read Greek. Anyway, let me just read to you what this is about. If scholars no longer necess necessarily find the essence and origins of what came to be known as Christianity and the personality of a historical figure known as Jesus of Nazareth, it nevertheless remains the case that the study of early Christianity is dominated by an assumption of the force of Jesus' personality on divergent communities. In The God, Man, and the Sea, Michael Fate shifts the terms of this study by focusing on the Gospel of Mark, which ends when Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and, and Salome discover a few days after the crucifixion that Jesus' tomb has been opened, but the corpse is not there. Unlike the other Gospels, Mark does not include the resurrection, portraying instead loss, puzzlement, and despair in the face of the empty tomb. Although we all know that Mark also has, I forget at what time it was, 
added in, but every Bible you will see at the end of Mark, it'll say, because there is a, like a conclusion that they add in. Um, oh, but, okay, I'm going off into a, a tangent there, but anyway. Uh, reading Mark's Gospel as an exemplary text, fate examines what he considers to be retellings of other traumatic experiences. This is where it really gets intriguing. Uh, the stories of Jesus is exercising demons out of a man and into a herd of swine, his stilling of the storm, and his walking on the water, drawing widely on a diverse set of resources that include the canon of Western fiction, classical literature, the psychology study of trauma, phenomenological philosophy, say that five times fast, uh, the new materialism, psychoanalytic theory, post-structural philosophy, and Hebrew, Hebrew Bible scholarship, um, as well as the expected catalog of New Testament tools of biblical criticism in general, and Markan scholarship in particular, the God Man in the Sea is an experimental reading of the Gospel of Mark and the social force of the sea within its traumatized world. That just intrigued the heck out of me. So, uh, more fundamentally, however, it attempts to position this reading as a story of trauma, ecstasy, and what has become uh, through the ruins of past pain. See, Michael Thate is an associate research scholar at the Center for the Study of Religion at Princeton University. Um, fabulous. This book just came out this month, February 2020. Uh, it's part of a series of books from uh, University of Pennsylvania Press that is called Divinations, Rereading Late Ancient Religion. As you can see, it says there down at the bottom. Um, the God Man and the Sea. So if I like this, now I'll try to ch check out some of their other titles in the series. Um, so this book, yeah, minus all of the copious uh, bibliography footnotes, it's not a super long, wow, it's not a super long work. It probably can't be. It probably can't sustain this level of uh, scholarship for very long. It's, it's, it's heavy and deep. Um, it's a little over 200 pages. And the artwork is it's crazy. I love it. <laughs> you can just take a while trying to figure out what is what is meant there. I'm looking at the screen. It's so crazy. Okay, guys. So, uh, wow. 37 minutes. I've talked a bushel. Um, and wouldn't you know it, this is not even the tip of the iceberg of what I need to show you. so much going on. Anyway, guys, Friday reads, tons of good stuff. Um, I think I can really get some more done once I'm done with the books I've been assigned for the booktube prize, booktube prize judging, uh, which I've been enjoying. They've been really good books in my, in my group so far. Um, oh, I can't say anything about them. That's right. Well, you don't know how I'm going to rank them. So anyway, um, but yeah, I wanted to show you some of these new arrivals. Let me know what you think about them. Um, let me know what books interest you guys, and also I'd like to know what your Friday reads are. I haven't asked in a while, and I would love to know what you guys are reading, so if you're going to comment anyway, please tell me in the comments what you're reading. Uh, I would love to know, and uh, let's see. This weekend, I have more reading to do. Uh, I'm going to be cleaning house, doing fun chores, fun chores, um, hanging out with my homies, you know, as you do, and um, making more more videos because I do have, um, like I said, a couple of book hauls, and I have a used book haul I want to show you as well. So, okay, guys, so I'm going to end this here. I hope you don't mind the 40-minute video. I know a few of you have said you like it. Um, I hope you're having a great Friday. Uh, stay safe. Wash your hands. Um, always wash your hands anyway. Well, always wash your hands anyway, but especially in this day and age, things are crazy. I want to ask you guys, too, uh, how you're feeling about this whole ear quick quick poll. Coronavirus, COVID-19. Hysteria or, or not? What do you think? Is it for real or is it just uh, something we're kind of making a mountain out of a molehill? It's for, yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards it's for real. Knowing how sick we got and how sick I got with just a standard strain of flu in December and January, that laid me flat. And nothing ever lays me flat, but it laid me flat. And uh, I can't even imagine this thing. So 
Anyway, guys, I want you to be well. I want you to be safe. I want you to enjoy your books this weekend. Um, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, BookTube. Bye-bye.